Hello again, YouTubers, and welcome back. I'm very excited to present this series of videos to you because finally, after we've spent all this time talking about conservation of mass and conservation of momentum, and we've obtained the Navier-Stokes equations, finally we can talk about how to solve these or apply these equations to solve real problems uh, involving Newtonian fluid flow. And what I want to emphasize throughout this uh, series is the procedure because if you recall the Navier-Stokes equations are a complicated uh, system of nonlinear coupled partial differential equations and in general it's not easy to obtain solutions uh, to this system of equations especially analytically but there are classes of problems where we're able to obtain useful solutions and that's what I'm going to talk about here uh, in one example involving pipe flow but what I really want you to notice is that the procedure that we're going to apply to solve these problems can be applied to any uh, problem uh, involving solving the Navier-Stokes equations. And if you stick with my procedure, uh, I guarantee you that you're going to be able to at least solve the fluid mechanics part of the problem. You'll be able to reduce the Navier-Stokes equations down to a uh, simpler system of differential equations that you'll be able to solve uh, in combination with the appropriate boundary or initial conditions. So if you follow my procedure, it's foolproof. You'll be able to, to reach, at least obtain, uh, the appropriate mathematical form. And, th and then after that, it becomes a math problem. It becomes a differential equations problem, and that's a different, uh, different topic. Okay, so to get started, I want to show you uh, step one uh, of this procedure, and that is to choose a coordinate system for the problem. And in order to do that, you can ask yourself two questions. Uh, one question is, what direction is the flow? So what direction is the fluid moving in? And the other important question to ask is, in what direction does the velocity change? So remember our simple shear flow, right? The flow was horizontal between parallel plates, but the velocity was changing in the vertical direction, uh, you know, perpendicular to the plate. So the flow direction and the direction in which the velocity changing uh, in general may not be uh, in the same direction. So there are two different quantities to think about. But both of those directions are important uh, in how we set up the problem. The second thing to ask yourself is to determine what is the driving force for the flow. So in the kinds of problems that we're going to be considering here, there's three main driving forces. Pressure is probably the main driving force, pressure-driven flow. So, for example, in a pipe, uh, you have a pressure difference between the inlet and the outlet. Uh, so that's an example of pressure-driven flow. Shear-driven flow is the example that I just talked about before that I showed you when we talked about Newton's law of viscosity, where the flow is driven by sliding or a relative motion between uh, different surfaces uh, in which the fluid is in contact. And gravity can also be a driving force. You can also have gravity-driven flows, for example, a uh, thin film of fluid uh, flowing down an inclined plane is an example uh, of a gravity-driven flow. Okay, so we've chosen the coordinate system. We've determined what the driving force is. The next step is to determine the boundary conditions associated with the flow. And so by boundaries, I mean pretty much boundaries in which the fluid is in contact. Uh, can we say something about what the state of the fluid is at certain known locations in the problem. So the no-slip condition, for example, that we talked about again uh, in Newton's law of viscosity, that's an example of a boundary condition. We know that the velocity at a boundary of the fluid in contact with the boundary is equal to the boundary, at least that's an assumption that we make. Uh, and there's other boundary conditions uh, that we'll be able to apply and we'll talk about some of those as we go through some of these examples. Step four is to make some kind of guess about what the solution should look like. So we have some intuition uh, based on uh, these previous three questions. What will the flow look like? So for example, again, flow between parallel plates, uh, we expect the velocity to go from zero at the stationary plate to the boundary velocity at the plate that's moving. So we know that there's going to be some variation from zero to some non-zero velocity, and we can expect, based on experience, what that may look like. And, and this is where kind of, you know, after you work more and more problems, you sort of are able to predict 
based on your past knowledge and past experience, what uh, what these solutions should look like. So this is kind of difficult to do at first, but but once you once you work a few problems uh, and get those under your belt, you should be able to uh, to to build your intuition, uh, your engineering intuition, and and make an educated guess. And that's important because then you can determine if your solution uh, that you obtain uh, is realistic. Then once we do all these steps, once we determine what coordinate system we're using, what are the key directions within that space, what is the driving force and what are the boundary conditions, and what is the form of the solution, then we can go forward and solve the conservation equations uh, to reduce them to the key terms that are going to contribute to the solution. So remember the Navier-Stokes equations, for example, has a lot of terms. If we consider all three components in whatever coordinate system we're interested in, but we're going to find at least for some elementary problems that we can simplify that down quite a bit uh, into a form that, that's less intimidating. And once we do that, then the final step is to solve uh, the resulting system of differential equations uh, and boundary conditions. And what we're going to want to obtain is the velocity components uh, as a function of position uh, in, our, in our system. So for example, if we're in Cartesian coordinates, we would want to find the x, y, and z velocity components as a function of position x, y, and z in the parameter space. And once we've done that, then we've solved the problem. So again, these are six steps and they seem pretty straightforward, but if you can follow this procedure, I guarantee you that you can really uh, confidently attack uh, just about any uh, a fluid mechanic problem that, that is going to come your way. Okay, now that we've defined this solution procedure and I told you how great it is, let's see how we can apply it to solve a real problem. And this is a problem that's actually of interest uh, to us, uh, as particularly as chemical engineers, but also uh, uh, just about any any engineer might be interested in in flow through a pipe. And so that's what we're going to consider first. And we want to look at a geometry that consists of a cylindrical space. So this is the pipe, and it has some radius a and some length l and there's fluid flowing through this pipe we can say from left to right and we want to find what is the velocity distribution uh, inside the pipe as a function of position okay so let's then work through our procedure that I showed you on the previous slide and remember the first step was to choose a coordinate system so we ask ourselves what direction is the flow direction and what direction is it varying in so since this pipe has a cylindrical shape, I think it's pretty clear that this symmetry would suggest that cylindrical coordinates may be a good choice for the problem. And we're going to see this more clearly as we work through this, but the reason to choose uh, cylindrical coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates is because we'll be able to simplify the problem into uh, basically one variable. So we could choose Cartesian coordinates, x and y, but then we would have x and y components of these equations that we would have to deal with and it would make the solution procedure more complicated. It's not that it couldn't be done, it would just be harder to do it. But if we look for some symmetry in the problem, particularly here we have cylindrical symmetry, then we can use that to our advantage to make the problem easier to solve. So based on the cylindrical coordinate system, we have the z-direction going uh, from left to right, so the flow is in the z-direction, okay, velocity is in the z-direction, and then r is perpendicular, uh, and theta is the uh, the rotational, uh, the angle, angular position uh, about the z-axis. So we can imagine that uh, if we believe that the flow is in the z-direction, we can imagine that the flow is probably going to vary in the r-direction. Why do we say that? Well, we know that we have to have no slip at the walls. So probably the fluid velocity is going to be zero near the walls. And if we have a flow through this pipe, then it's got to be non-zero somewhere. So the velocity is probably going to change from zero at the walls uh, to some non-zero value uh, in the interior of the pipe. And that would correspond to a variation in the r-direction. There's not really any obvious driving force or geometric constraint in the problem that would suggest any variation in the theta direction. So 
I think it's pretty safe to assume that we're not going to have any r or theta components of the velocity. So if we combine these insights, this suggests that we have flow in the z direction. So our velocity component of interest is just going to be the z component of velocity. And it's going to vary in the r direction. So we're going to have vz as a function of r. This is our velocity component of interest for the purposes of this problem. OK, now we want to decide what is the driving force for this flow. So I, I may have already stated it. Uh, it's actually pressure-driven flow. Uh, so again, we have a pressure difference, a higher pressure on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side. Uh, we'll create a driving force for flow uh, from left to right in the z direction. Uh, and again, uh, you know, pressure, gravity, shearing, those are the kind of driving forces that are usually uh, of interest to us, uh, at least for the purposes of this course. Now the next step in our procedure is to identify the boundary conditions. And we kind of talked about that a little bit already when we were discussing how to set up our coordinate system and define the key directions. So remember we said that the flow is in the z direction and the velocity varies with r. So we can look at our diagram and, and infer that near the walls, at r equals a, the velocity is probably going to be zero due to the no-slip condition because these are stationary boundaries and the velocity of the fluid adjacent to the boundary, immediately adjacent to the boundary, uh, is equal to the velocity of the boundary. That's what the no-slip condition says. And since those are stationary surfaces, then we expect the velocity to be zero at those locations. Now, what else can we say? We have one boundary condition. What else can we say about this flow? Well, what about at r equals zero? We know this is cylindrically symmetric uh, about the center line of this pipe. What can we say about the flow? Well, I'm going to propose a boundary condition and then I'm going to explain it later because I think it'll become clear as we solve the problem why I'm specifying this. But I'm going to say at the center line at r equals zero that the velocity is finite. What does that mean? Well, that just means that the velocity can't do any strange things. Velocity can't go to infinity. Uh, it can't uh, diverge. Uh, whatever kind of mathematical function we obtain to express the velocity profile as a function of r can't do anything weird at r equals 0. So this is a constraint. And I think it'll become clear why I'm saying this as we go through and actually begin to solve the differential equations associated with the problem. OK, the next step is to use our intuition and what we've said in steps one through three to kind of guess what the solution looks like. So remember, again, we know that the flow is in the z direction. We expect it to vary with r. And we know some boundary conditions. We know that at the outer walls, the velocity has to be 0. And at the center line, we know that the velocity is non-zero and has to be finite. So the velocity has to go from zero at the walls to some non-zero value. And it may look something like this. I don't know. This is just an idea. But it's zero at the walls and non-zero somewhere in the interior. So our objective now is to determine what the mathematical form of this velocity profile is. What's the equation for this curve? Is it a straight line? Is it a parabola? Is it a quadratic or a cubic or is it a sine or a cosine? We don't know yet. So we hope that we can get the shape of this curve mathematically by solving the Navier-Stokes equations.